can see a lot of this if you just go out at night um, in the summertime, of course, away from the city and the city lights. Uh, you can see the Milky Way yourself, and you can see dust in space yourself. Dust is just uh, like little grains of sand floating around in space. Not really like the dust under your bed. Um, this painting's got a lot of amazing stuff. Uh, the Milky Way itself is about 100,000 light years across, so that means uh, light would take 100,000 years. If somebody was trying to phone home from the other side of the galaxy, message would take 100,000 years to get here, and then, of course, 100,000 years to get back. Very slow conversation. Um, what we're seeing here in this painting is mostly uh, billions of stars, and uh, so all this uh, white glow that you're seeing is the stars um, in our galaxy, of which our own sun is one. And uh, we're about a third of the way out from the center of the galaxy. Um, we haven't actually seen the dragons yet, but we're looking for them. <laughs> Uh, I hope everybody comes up and takes a really close pic uh, look at this painting afterward because there's a lot of stuff in there. I'm just going to show you a couple of things. Um, this is, uh, of course, in the upper left is a little bit from the painting itself. And then uh, Lowe writes an actual uh, photograph of the sky. Uh, possibly what he had in, the artist had in mind, but you can see a lot of similarities. This is a, a nebula. Um, which the red color is coming from, the light from the hydrogen atoms in the gas, and we're going to be talking about the hydrogen atom uh, in a minute. Um, this is another very famous uh, nebula, uh, known as the Eagle Nebula, but often referred to as the Pillars of Creation. Um, and uh, this is a picture taken with Hubble Space Telescope in the lower right. And you can see the artist was probably had seen that picture. Uh, was doing the painting. Uh, there's a lot of little things all over the painting. There's, uh, this is a nebula in the, uh, you can just see there's some gas and stars mixed together and I just showed a picture here in the lower right uh, to show what a, a real nebula with stars that are forming. Uh, stars form out of cl these clouds of gas and dust that collapse under their own weight uh, and form stars. And here's a lovely uh, star cluster. We call these uh, globular clusters. There's um, over 100 of them in our own galaxy. And you can see quite a few of them in this painting if you look around. Um, and you can see how distinctive they are. This is a real one in the lower right. Um, and you can see how uh, it was uh, rendered in the, in the, in the painting. Um, so come up afterward and just take a look at this. Um, there's a lot of good astronomy in this painting. So um, the next slide is actually in the real painting in the far lower left, so you'll have to come up after to see. And the artist Iwasaki put this in here to indicate how what we perceive is not just out there, but it's the relationship of the perceiver and the perceived. And this is important in the Buddhist concern to how do we stop suffering because often what we perceive is coded by what we like and what we don't like and what we don't understand. And um, so the Buddhists are concerned with how do we get clear perception, clear understanding of reality. And it does not, it, it is, does not mean that we have to give up our bodies and our cultural modes but to just to understand the nature of the body and our cultural experience. Iwasaki Sudeo combined within himself the Buddhist, the artist, and the scientist. And all of that clearly is pervades in his painting of the Big Bang, and you see the Buddha figure. And uh, what is interesting, of course, is that all humans have certainly looked at the night sky and looked at the stars and the galaxies, and different cultures and civilizations have all had their perspectives uh, on this. And what is interesting, many times, for instance, as whether it's the Indian or the European tradition, we concentrate on the stars. Now, since as an astrophysicist, we have Jeff here who actually studies dust. He already mentioned dust. 
But for most people, it's the stars that stick out in the night sky. And from the ancients, we have these constellations. You sort of connect dots. And of course, you want to orient with respect to the North Pole, the North Star, and then the Great Bear, or other constellations like Scorpio, and so on. And so I thought it would be interesting to see here uh, a, a group of peoples on Earth who actually have a completely different perspective on the night sky. Now these are the aboriginal peoples of Australia and the Torres Strait Islands, these are the, uh, this is the uh, uh, waters between Australia and New Guinea, and uh, they actually concentrated on the dust. Now looking at the skies of course has both a practical importance as navigation, so all these people who had to roam either over land or over seas developed their orientations, now this is in the southern sky, uh, but they actually concentrated more on the dust and associated it with the animals and so on they know. So for instance, just as you see in this Iwasaki painting or in the galaxy picture that uh, Jeff showed, on the right is the galaxy and the dominant feature are the, are the dust clouds and they associated that with the emu, which is a bird somewhat like an ostrich but the one in Australia, which they see. And, uh, and this is just uh, in the rock paintings, incidentally again, we know about cave paintings and so on from Europe, from France, but there are some even older ones in uh, the Aboriginal paintings. And so this is a projection of the emu in the sky, again, the galaxy on the left and the emu as they see it. Uh, and then, very interestingly, coming over to the Americas, uh, here are the Incas in the Peruvian Andes. This is actually a painting and they, of course, saw a llama in the sky, but it's, it's essentially the same. And I think it's very interesting, particularly from the point of view of Iwasaki as an artist, because art often is about foreground and background in any painting. And so this is to bring out that different cultures, of course, see the same thing in different ways. Any questions about the Big Bang? He was a biologist um, for most of his career, uh, Japanese. He served in World War II and then went on to spend the rest of his life in a small town outside of Nagoya, Japan. Um, and he did ex work with microscopes a lot in his work on viruses. And he came up with an art form after retirement and it required using a magnifying glass to actually paint in the tiny strokes that he did. And he has been recognized as a master painter, even though he was never trained formally. Um, his brushwork is, um, does not betray uh, just a hobbyist. And the, the quality of his thinking and his understanding of the Buddhist teachings, I would rate him up there with, you know, the other famous Buddhist masters I've studied through texts. The whole point in the, in the Buddhist teachings, there's a, a subtitle to this painting, Big Bang e equals MC squared. And there's a Buddhist teaching, form is emptiness, emptiness is form, which is the main teaching of the Heart Sutra he uses in all these paintings. And so, Form is likened to mass or matter, things we can perceive with our senses. And um, emptiness is likened to energy. And with the conservation of energy that everything is transforming, that's also the Buddhist, it's very resonant with the Buddhist view, that everything is just transforming. And because everything is transforming, um, we are all interrelated. The atoms that came out of the Big Bang now, you know, they've scattered all in us. And when we pass on, our atoms will scatter and become different forms. That They won't disappear. And so that's the import of uh, things constantly changing is another way of saying everything's interrelated. Okay. Um, one final, anyone have one more question? Well, just tell us the size of the black hole the library. When you first showed us this painting, you talked about some scale. Uh, uh, well, one thing that he says is the uh, to remind us that the when we see the sunset, it's actually eight minutes after it has passed our horizon. That's it takes eight minutes for the light to get to us. So that's eight minutes of time 
light time. And uh, the black hole, he said, is like 26 light years away from us, which is a very long way. And, and I, I stand to be corrected about all of this. 25,000. 25,000. I few, lost off a few zeros. Um, and then the, that, the, the a light hole, the, I mean, a black hole doesn't take a space, but the accretion disk the, and all that matter that is accrued around it is something like nine light years across? Yes, something like that. It depends on how much mass there is. In the yeah. Uh, very quickly, it is, in a sense, uh, the energy that moves through the universe, um, that energy is emptiness. Emptiness is not a nothingness. Emptiness is the energy for the potential for all forms. So that's what the dragons are symbolizing. And the wisdom to see that, to understand that, is what will help you perceive reality in a way that you won't generate suffering. When you misperceive reality, you will generate suffering. So if you understand the nature of dragons or emptiness or how energy transforms, that will help you stop suffering. Um, Okay, so now I'm going to direct your attention. We're going to turn it over to Dr. Rao for a few moments. We're going to be looking at the um, reproduction in the back corner of this room, the top left. It looks like an atom. It is one, right? <laughs> I projected up there, no? Oh, yes, yeah. yes, yes. You can look yes. in here front now, too. sorry. <laughs> Actually, some, uh, the, the question that was asked by you about the interconnectedness of things and what was just raised about emptiness and form fits very well to what we have now discussed a little bit. Uh, this painting, which as was pointed out, is there, and again, I invite you later to go and look at it in detail, but uh, it's projected there. And uh, Jeff mentioned, for instance, the hydrogen atom, and you saw the, the thing in red, because excited hydrogen atoms, when they radiate, they radiate in the red, so it's usually shown as red. And most of our universe, 75% of it actually, is hydrogen. So hydrogen is both the most common element in the universe and it's also the simplest of the atoms. And Iwasaki has a painting of the hydrogen atom, which in fact in another painting we'll discuss next, is sort of the one that brings everything together. And this particular depiction of the hydrogen atom is a good place to mention a few uh, parallels. Now something was said about the overlapping of astrophysical or physical things with the Buddhist, I don't quite see things as so much overlapping the two things, but rather as ideas in parallel. And so for instance, the concept of nothingness and form. So let me talk a little bit about the structure of atoms. Again, uh, the ancients, many, many people have, uh, have thought about the structure of matter. I mean, we have matter, we have something hard here, and whether it is this or a chunk of iron, and of course you can break it up, and so the question of can you keep doing this forever has of course occupied people for a very long time. And very early came the idea that maybe there is a limit to this and these are the atoms. So atoms were sort of postulated uh, hundreds, thousands of years ago and that they exist as the basic components. Now about a hundred years ago, physics of course saw that the atom itself has a structure. It can be broken further and in particular, I think nearly everybody knows that there is a, a so-called nucleus which is positively charged in the center and then there are these negatively charged electrons around them. Now, the simplest atom has just one object in the center, the nucleus, which is this positively charged particle called the proton and then there is the negatively charged electron around it. Uh, now, Everyone is uh, uh, accustomed to this from the atomic energy logos and so on to see the atom depicted this like this, somewhat like a solar system. But first of all, uh, I'm carefully using the word around it. It is not that it is in any specific orbit or so on, but it is in some way around the positive charge. Now what is very interesting is the scale of things here. If you look at the volume of the proton in the center of any, in a bigger atom, let's say a few things about it, in the nucleus, that volume compared to the volume of the atom is something like a million billion, 10 to the 15 in, in uh, scientific terms, smaller. 
So most of the atom is actually nothing, nothingness equation. It's void. Uh, but that doesn't mean there isn't form. In fact, the very stability of all matter, including matter in the bulk, but going down all the way to the atom, the very stability of matter depends on this structure that uh, we have learned to understand in the last 100 years, both the overall structure and what gives rise to it. And here, quantum ideas play a very important role. And in particular, there are two of them that let me just mention in very simple terms. One is that in the quantum level, any particle, say you take the electron, which is very light, any particle, by just being confined to a smaller distance, there's a kind of unescapable energy buildup, a momentum or an energy buildup, which can be thought of as a pressure. Uh, people have heard the words uncertainty principle, so you can think of this as a kind of uncertainty principle pressure. So that keeps the electron from getting too close to the proton or to the nucleus. That's one. The second principle is, that happens for all particles, my first one, but the second one is for many, many particles like the electrons, the protons, and the neutrons, a second element of the quantum comes in, that such particles, when you have many of them, and you try to combine, to, uh, to collapse them together, again, there's a kind of pressure. You can use the term a Pauli pressure for this, but between the two of them, all the stability of matter, including the form of matter, is to be understood in these two terms. So those two quantum ideas with this picture of a positively charged nucleus and electrons around it in some fashion, surrounding it in all three-dimensional space, is really the structure of atom. And here comes very close this parallel to the Art Sutra or in, or in Buddhism terms of emptiness uh, and form. The very form of something, the very form of an object, if you look at it deeply enough in some ways, a lot of it is empty, but empty doesn't mean nothing. And in fact, the structure itself depends on that uh, combination of, of elements. All right, so we're gonna flow right into, if you wouldn't mind advancing the slide, to our next piece, which is the mandala. Um, it's located around the corner. We're not gonna go there yet, because it's right here. This is the full piece, but after you should go check it out around the corner. Um, I think we're going to turn it back over to Jeff briefly. And we're going to sort of go around the circle here and uh, talk about some, some pieces of it. And um, you could start anywhere in the circle, so... Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but it's, it's showing the evolution both of the universe and uh, of us. And uh, so it, it shows uh, atoms, and uh, you may recognize that could be a hydrogen atom again. After the beginning of the universe, which uh, was mainly just hydrogen and helium gas, uh, after the Big Bang, uh, it coalesced into stars and galaxies. And, um, and then uh, what we're seeing here is, as we go around, is more and more complex uh, forms. And uh, we'll see already here a more complicated uh, atom. Some great amount of time, of course, is passing here and uh, as we're going around the circle. And uh, this is just a little insect, which is from, which painting is this from? It's over there on the far left. This is actually a fourth uh, painting that we're, but it, it shows just in a uh, nice miniature here uh, how you form a solar system and planets from uh, a cloud of gas. And so I've got a little diagram on the right there, but going from the upper right to the lower left is the same uh, process in the painting, uh, where we start with a cloud of gas and dust which collapses under its own weight. It's got a little rotation, so it usually ends up as a disk shape, and uh, which is how our solar system is. And uh, the gas and dust starts, uh, most of it ends up in the center as the star, and then the leftovers sort of clump together, orbiting the star and form into the planets. And, uh, and then you can see down in the lower left there, the Earth has formed. And here's our solar system in the other painting. And so now we're concentrating on the solar system and the evolution that's taking place 
after the solar system is formed. And here's our Earth forming. Uh, when it first forms, it was uh, completely lava all the way through, uh, liquid rock, which is why it ends up as a, as a round shape, because that, the rock being uh, liquid would just float around. But eventually, it starts to cool, and uh, I'm going to pass over now to see to, for someone else to tell us what happens when the Earth cools down. Uh, yes, Iwasaki has an enormous amount of detail in each of these paintings, and they're worth sort of looking carefully. And so, for instance, of course, you see the waters formed the, at the lower part of this, and then he starts showing the atoms aggregating into molecules, and he is actually very careful. There's no legend to these, as you would see in maps, but it's very clear that he's representing the hydrogen atom, the smallest atom by the smallest circle, and a bigger one for oxygen. And so there you see the H2O that everybody recognizes, the water molecules, and then he has these black circles, which is the carbon, so you will see some carbon and two oxygens, the CO2, and you see carbon and three or four uh, hydrogens, the methane, and then he goes further and in fact builds up even bigger molecules. And it, you can actually identify individual molecules. There is some nitrogen from time to time, so he has put an N in them, because of course that's a very important component of organic molecules of which our bodies are made. And uh, so you can actually identify, and then there are the rings, that you see in the very left. So you can actually, I think a chemist here can actually identify individually these molecules. So it's, it's done with great uh, care and detail and uh, worth looking at. So I will advance a little bit more. This is still the aggregation of the proteins and we eventually get to self-organization. We don't really know what the step was between the proteins and finally a living cells. And as we heard before, there was a long time spent before life started. And when you go back to that uh, painting behind you later on, you will see that the, evol the organic evolution, this means the evolution of life, is just shown in the lower quadrant. And it's relatively short. So. What I'll show you here is, of course, I put some words in the lower corner. You can read it if you want. You don't need to, but those of you who are interested. And it's the beginning for a very long time. You see, it's um, extremely long time. We just have algae, fungi, and unicellular organisms. And this is shown at the beginning. And in the next slide, we still have unicellular organisms, amoeba and paramecia, and then algae, unicellular algae, longer algae, and fungi. And then finally, after all that time, we come to the moment where invertebrates are being evolved. And that is now much a shorter time. You know, once you have a multicellular organism starting, then we have an explosion of different forms. And what I would like to point out here is that we really get a feeling for um, Iwasaki Tsuneo not being just a great artist and a philosopher, but really a trained biologist. Because I had a wonderful time in identifying all these uh, small animals that he painted. They are identifiable down to the family or sometimes even to the species as we will see, as we will see later. And that, of course, as a fellow biologist, I was very excited about. And if we go to the next level, you just see the sea star at the bottom right and the first vertebrates. So these are the first fish and an amphibian up there at the upper corner. And at the same time, we have the first vascular plants that evolved. So it's not anymore just uh, algae, but we have now real formed uh, plants that happen. And what I would like to point out to you is that just below the fish, we have an embryo 
in an egg. And the egg, of course, is surrounded by water and the membrane, and it is in the water. And what we see just on top is how amphibians are starting to get on land. Amphibious means really both lives, in the water and on land. If you go to the next stage, you still see the amphibian at the bottom. And then the next stage is really the first land vertebrates, a dinosaur, a stegosaur. We also have uh, the first bird, Archaeopteryx, at the, at the top. And of course, we have pterosaurs. And what is very interesting, and again, this is a biologist who was thinking about it, is that he shows again an embryo in an egg. And that egg, again, is full of water, surrounded by a membrane, just like the eggs that we had of fish. And that's our inheritance from our ancestors that were actually living in water. And we take this along with us as we uh, come on land. And then in the next layer, now we, we see the full flowering of what we are most uh, familiar with. At the bottom, it's a kangaroo as an example of a marsupial, or we have here an opossum that is also in the same group. Then an elephant as a representative of a placental mammal. And I always have to smile when I see this elephant because I suspect that um, Iwasaki Tsuneo never saw an elephant. Maybe it's a mammoth. Maybe it's a mammoth. But even a mammoth doesn't look like that. But I think <laughs> as an as an artist, I look at it, and it doesn't matter, because it is beautiful, and it shows, really, it represents the strong uh, mammals, the placental mammals that today most mammals are. Then if you look slightly on the left, you see something that looks like a butterfly. It's yellow, but it is not. These are ginkgo biloba uh, leaves that are very famous in philosophy and also in natural science. And there is a beautiful specimen of a ginkgo in front of the music school. So if you want to see it, and soon in November, you will see exactly this color. Then the next will be a primate, a monkey. And then higher up is probably um, some kind of Australopithecus. It's the first primate walking on two legs. And then we finally get to the humans. And what I find very interesting is that the human on the left is clearly, as I see it, um, a connection to the movie 2001 with the first humans uh, shown um, starting to beat on a rock, making noise, and of course starting the aggression. Uh, again, we see the embryo within an egg. And next to, and that I would like to point out, there are these uh, cypresses. And I thought, what could it be? And this is the, the other part of what we know very well here in Louisiana, the swamp cypress. And there is a very close, re closely related tree in China, which is called the mammoth tree. It's very closely related to, to our swamp. Cyprus, but it is almost extinct. And so we are very lucky and we should take great care of our own swamp cypresses. And then finally something that Paula had pointed out to me, just next to the standing human being, these are cherry blossoms. And so I see this almost as a counterpoint to the rather aggressive beginning, or at least we think so, of human beings, and then the transcendence into cherry blossoms. And the next slide, I don't, I don't know whether it shows. Yes, not quite, but the earth. And what we do now is really to step back from the actual living uh, beings and go back into the cosmos. And, uh, and now we're seeing the solar system again, and also giving us the idea that a lot of time is passing. We're all going around this circle, of course, is uh, billions of years. Um, 
Uh, of course, our planet and the solar system have been around for about four and a half billion years. Um, our sun is going to last for, we don't know how much longer we're going to last here on Earth, but um, the Earth will still be here and the sun will still be here. Um, and as we move along the circle here, um, this is the next stage in the upper left uh, in the painting, um, another six or seven billion years, um, our sun is going to become what's called a red giant. And I just show in the lower right there, the, the size of the sun is going to increase greatly. In fact, it may increase to the point where the Earth is actually inside the sun, which is considered to be a bad thing. Um, and so at that point, uh, hopefully we'll have, if we're still around, we'll have moved uh, somewhere else. Um, and the next stage um, is this ring that you see, and uh, that's what's known as a planetary nebula, um, where the, uh, the star is actually blown off its surface hydrogen, and it's floating away, forming this beautiful ring. And, uh, and then we get back up, on, uh, the next thing is uh, the end of the life of our sun, which is going to be what's called a white dwarf, and um, if you're looking at the painting, that will take you all the way back up to the top of the painting again. And, uh, and you start over. I should say, a mandala in Buddhist art is recognized as an enlightened view of reality. So this was his understanding of an enlightened understanding of reality. So now we're back to questions. We have about 10 minutes left. Um, and we can, you can ask questions about anything that's come up in the discussion, because we're kind of back to close. So, does anyone want the mic? I mean, was, a while ago, it was this question was asked about the Heart Sutra, which actually is the, the heart of the perfect understanding Sutra. So, I mean, the basic thing is that everything is interconnected, and just eloquently expressed just a while ago. But in science, the progress has been made again and again by forgetting about this and looking at one system at a time. So either looking at hydrogen atom, as we talk, talked about, looking at single black hole, like what happened with gravitational waves recently. So there is a fundamental tension between these ideas, between science and this Buddhism. It, it, it's a kind of a, if you look at the external world, it seems very important to look at, not holistically at all, but one piece at a time. And there, progress is made. That is why we've got a biologist, and we've got a physicist, and an astrophysicist. I'm not just one person. Whereas, when you look at the internal world, it seems that, you know, as the Sutra says, somehow it seems to be that uh, it's important to have this completely holistic picture, interconnectivity, and so on. So to me, it seems like a very fundamental basic tension. And if anybody wants to comment on it, I would be grateful. Well, one thing I would say first is that um, those who actively began the conversations between Buddhist views of reality and scientific views of reality, what they saw in each other was that they're both experimentally based traditions. And it's about observation, experimenting, seeing what works. If it doesn't work, then try something else. And in the Buddhists, uh, the Buddhists have tried to find out what helps you stop suffering. And they are not looking for some absolute truth. Truth is actually that which helps you stop suffering, which can be different for each person. Um, so in a sense, yes, looking at the whole, the wisdom that's coursing through the universe, um, can help you, but for some, maybe looking, you know, at some small piece is the entryway um, to help you stop suffering, not saying that's where you'll stop. Um, so I wouldn't say that absolutely the Buddhists are always looking for the whole, because there, there is no absolute. Um, it's what's effective, is the concern. Um, and I, so I don't know if the aims of the scientific tradition, um, that those seem to be quite different. Um, so to 
separate things out, I think that helps for some understanding and perhaps collaboration brings about a different kind of understanding. But I don't know if you can't get collaborative understanding. But then there is a whole other uh, uh, discipline of science, and this would be evolutionary biology. And we are extremely looking at the whole because individual parts don't mean very much for an organism. The organism is really quintessentially something that is composed of many different parts and can work only when everything is together. So I think in science itself, we have many different ways on how to look at the world, just like Paula said. And what is always interesting, of course, in these comparisons is to look at both the similarities and the differences. Now, I used the word parallel earlier, and the reason is that I say that in some ways, on the scale of evolution, our brains themselves haven't changed all that much in 5,000 or 10,000 years. So it's not to me such a surprise that in terms of some of the questions asked, or even some of the ideas that have been thrown up, whether it's in a religious tradition or somewhere else, similar questions were asked. But of course, the way we look at it can be very different. And what is, what is interesting to me, for instance, about this nothingness and form, or in another aspect of the interconnectedness which was raised, is this idea in the Heart Sutra that there are no individual entities. Everything is connected. And actually, in very interesting ways in quantum physics, as of course you very well know, uh, we actually say that, for instance, an electron, I mean, there is something we call a field, an electron field, and to that extent, one electron here, another electron there, many electrons, this interconnectedness is again a theme, but of course it has come up in a very different way and in a, in a technical way that we study and so on. But uh, to me what is interesting is that ideas run in parallel, because the ideas themselves that are generated in some ways, they, they, there are these assonances, if you wish, not so much a direct mapping or an overlap. And I think we scientists need to be able to see our own subject with different eyes, because this is where the ideas are coming from. And uh, again, uh, working on philosophy as an evolutionary uh, biologist, I feel that in many ways we can talk with each other. But I give you a very practical example of where, for instance, Eastern and Western ways of seeing can come together, and this is in medicine. We, of course, are very uh, familiar with Western medicine. We all go to Western doctors. But in the last 30 years that I have uh, observed things, we start to understand more and more that there are other ways on how to look at medicine. And so, for instance, as an anatomist, uh, what I'm very f fascinated with is to be able to see that maybe acupuncture has something very real to do with either nerves or with uh, lymphatic systems. And so this rapprochement to look at the same thing from a different angle, I think it is extremely valuable. And it's particularly in the field of neuroscience and psychology, working with humans and trying to find out what's happening in the brain of those who are known to be strong meditators and how plastic the, the brain is and can we cultivate happiness and compassion and kindness. That's a very concrete question that they're asking to see if you can see a difference between those who are recognized with those capacities and is there something different about their brains. The short answer is they have found notable things that they can train people to do. And I would just end with one thing I, I would hope you would understand about the Buddhist tradition is to think of it all as a verb. There are no nouns. It's all verbs. And even if there are concepts that are set aside as if they're nouns, those are just tools to help you understand the activity that's all verb. Thank you.